Okay, today we're going to talk about health and healthcare. I am not a health policy expert, so I apologize in advance for disappointing you by not being able to get into all the uh, nitty gritty details of exactly how you will be compensated under the, <clears throat> the Affordable Care Act, but the debate about it and the ongoing debate in American society about how we will um, provide health care for people. I'll have to update this should we ever settle it, but for now, the ongoing debate raises a lot of very fundamental moral questions, both about the role of the state and about the, the sort of ethical and moral boundaries of the individual body. So it's worth talking about, and it's a nice way to uh, bring discussions of literally life and death policy issues into play that, that are not about violence, which is, you know, when people think about life and death policy issues, we often think about um, wars, policing, punishment, execution, but lack of access to medical provision or, you know, lack of access to food, uh, lack of access to other sorts of things in society can, can in fact kill you just as dead as a bullet. Okay, so what are the big moral issues that tend to come up around health and in particular around health care? There's a sense in which um, health is a, is a natural thing. And in that way, it might look like it is just outside the realm of morality, right? If I get sick, that's on the face of it, that's sort of neither right nor wrong, right? I'm just sick. I got a virus. Viruses are amoral. But taking that perspective on health is similar to saying, look, if I get shot with a bullet, right? That's just physics. You know, the bullet isn't a moral actor. Of What's going on in both cases, of course, is that there is a social context that structures whether or not um, I'm likely to get shot, whether or not I'm likely to get sick, and what will be done about it um, if I do. So even though there is a natural aspect to issues of health, there is also a social aspect to it. Who gets sick? who has the ability to, to get medical attention, what kinds of physical stressors there are on people's bodies, is something that human action in significant part determines, and hence is, is open to moral critique and moral reflection. So, a few big things come up about this. One is the question of whether we have any sort of special right to health or to health care. Um, I remember during the debates about uh, the Affordable Care Act, there were people who said, look, um, you know, why should health care be any different from anything else? If I want a, a fancy new car and I have the money to get a fancy new car, great, I should be able to buy it. If I want one but I don't have the money, okay, well, uh, that's nobody's fault but my own. Why shouldn't healthcare be like that? If I want to be able to go to an expensive doctor and I have the money to go for it, great. And if not, eh. You know, it's not the responsibility of the society or the government to ensure everything that I might want. But if we think of healthcare as a right, or possibly if you don't like the, the rights language, as a need that gets some kind of special privilege, morally speaking, then um, it looks more plausible to think that in some way society ought to provide it to me. Uh, and in policy circles, this is typically going to be some variation on the state ought to, if not provide it to me directly, ensure that I am able to obtain it. Now, this brings us pretty quickly into the next big question, which is we don't have enough of the stuff that we need to keep everybody as healthy as it is physically possible for them to be, to go around. We can't simultaneously give everyone every single thing that would uh, help them reduce their risks of 
death or illness or other kinds of debility. This has become especially sharp in the last few decades where very expensive technologies that provide relatively marginal benefits have become available. So I know when I was in um, I was living in Canada in the 90s, one of the big debates was whether or not their universal health care system could cope with the additional cost of uh, preventative and screening technologies. So for instance, one of the debates I remember, the examples I remember being brought up in that debate was people said, look, in the 1970s, when Canada's health system was put in place in the way that it is now, if I'm not getting that date wrong, if a kid fell off his bike, you know, the doctor would look at his eyes and, you know, ask him if he was feeling drowsy, ask him if he had the unusual pain. And if he didn't see anything obvious from that, they would say, well, look, you know, put a nice pack on the bump and, and go home. Well, in some small percentage of cases like that, there could be internal bleeding inside the skull that would not be immediately obvious to that kind of inspection. However, um, an MRI could reveal that. Now, it's a small percentage, right? There's a small chance that you will have the kid who does not look like he has uh, internal bleeding or a concussion, yet an MRI would, would reveal that in fact he does. And an MRI is very expensive, right? Yet nonetheless, you know, if it's your kid and they say, look, there's a, you know, whatever, there's a 1% chance that they've got internal bleeding and they're going to die instead of just having some swelling. If you had the option, probably you would say, yeah, well, heck yeah, I want the, you know, I want all of the screening there is. I want the maximum amount of stuff for the minimum amount of risk. So we don't have enough, right? These things are expensive. Even we're not talking about things like MRIs. Like with most other things, we live in a world of moderate scarcity. We don't have enough for everyone to have everything they could possibly want, especially in the case of something like healthcare, where it's almost always possible to reduce your risk a little bit more, but it might be at a very great cost for the additional risk reduction. Okay, so we have this question, how do we distribute these limited resources? How do we decide who gets what? There's also a, a separate concern, and this comes up especially in light of recent research on social determinants of health, on the way in which your place in society affects your health, even aside from your access to direct things like medical care, um, whether or not we can separate out health from other kinds of justice concerns, other kinds of equity concerns. And finally, all of this raises, though in a slightly different direction, raises some serious questions about how far the state should be involved in the regulation of the body. How far we want the state to be able to, to sort of get its influence under your skin, sometimes in, in quite literal ways. Okay. So let's start with this question of whether health is special. Um, and there's at least three different kinds of views you might have on this. Probably more here are the three we're going to talk about. One is, no, health is not special. Health is being healthy or not being healthy are ways that your life can go well or not go well, but it's not different in a meaningful way from other kinds of ways in which your life can go well or not go well. Utilitarians, for instance will probably end up taking this kind of view about health, right? Being sick is a negative utility, but it's not a special kind of negative utility. It's not different from getting my bike stolen, right? It's just, you know, maybe it's different in magnitude, right? Being sick is worse than getting my bike stolen, but ultimately just all is the same stuff. It's just another good or bad thing that you can have happen in your life. A second option that has been proposed, um, the biggest Rawlsian on healthcare, uh, Norm Daniels, who we're going to read, ends up rejecting this, but it's a very plausible option uh, within the framework, is to say, look, let's take this basically Rawlsian liberal egalitarian framework, 
um, and say health is not just one of the many good things that uh, you know we worry about sub that we that we let people fend for themselves on once we satisfy the difference principle. Health is a primary good. It's in the same category of things like social esteem and wealth that need to be distributed in accord with the difference principle. So for those of you who, who maybe don't spend a lot of time thinking about Rawls, except when we read them a little while ago, uh, this means that that health or possibly health care, depending on how you want to think about it, is subject to the maximin criterion. We need to arrange our society in such a way so that the people who are worst off in terms of health or possibly health care, not the same thing, but related kinds of views, uh, are going to be as well off as they can be. We want to maximize the situation for the least well off people. Now, the reason, just as an aside, I say, well, it could be health or it could be health care, is that um, especially when you're dealing with extremely expensive, debilitating, but possibly non-fixable health conditions, uh, you may get some weirdness, right? Um, this goes back to the distinction between Dworkin and Rawls um, that led Dworkin to favor a kind of insurance rather than a straight maximum, and that, you know, there may be people in society who no amount of access to medical assistance will bring their health level up to, you know, the same as everybody else's. But there we go. Or option three, which is the option Daniels takes, is a little bit finicky one, but an interesting one. Um, and Daniels is very influential in the ethics of this, so it's worth at least knowing what he has to say, which is to say health is not its own primary good. Health is necessary for protecting equality of opportunity. If you are not healthy, you are not on the fair playing field that fair equality of opportunity in the Rawlsian scheme requires. Right? So on this kind of view, health is not a primary good like wealth. Health is an equality of opportunity thing like, um, like non-racial discrimination. As a result, it's actually even more privileged than a primary good. We need to satisfy a distribution of health resources in our society that supports fair equality of opportunity, even before we worry about uh, divvying up other kinds of good things. So this is an even stronger kind of thing. This would be this would say we need to to set up healthcare such that everybody nobody is held back, or at least nobody is held back as far as it can be avoided by their ill health or their exposure to uh, damage to their health before we even think about how to distribute other kinds of resources in society. Okay, so three kinds of major options. Um, you know, the drawback of the Daniels one, the Daniels one has a lot going for it, that's why he defends it. The drawback is that, as we'll talk about in a moment, this can lead to an especially comprehensive kind of impact of uh, redistribution of health resources. Hello, next slide. There we go. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about how we distribute these scarce resources. And this requires bringing up the dread R word in all healthcare conversations, rationing. If there is one thing that you take away from this conversation, from this class about health policy, it should be that every system with limited resources engages in rationing. Everybody rations healthcare. Everybody rations pretty much everything. Rationing just means making a decision about who is going to get what from a limited pool of resources. The only question that we have, once we acknowledge that we have limited resources, the only question we have is how? How are we rationing it? There is no system under which everyone is just able to get however much health care that they want. Because people are inevitably going to want 
expensive things that there's not enough of to go around. Not everyone is going to be able to get what they want, no matter what your system is. You need to ration. The question is, what is the morally appropriate way of rationing the healthcare to go around? Whether health is special is probably going to affect what you think is a reasonable way of rationing it. Just like everything else, um, whether you think that something is just a nice thing to have or whether you think it's something that people have a right to or something they need in a morally privileged fashion is going to have a big effect on what kind of system for determining who gets what you will think is acceptable. Right? So for instance, most of us, most people living here in a Western capitalist democracy like the United States, don't see anything terribly objectionable about distributing non-essential goods through a market. So something like a television, right? Nobody needs a television. People like televisions. They might figure into certain certain kinds of senses of the good life, but a television itself is not anything somebody needs. And so most people are pretty comfortable saying, well, look, you you know, if you can't afford a television, then you can't afford a television. You know, and you don't get one. Right? We might argue about the overall justice of the system that determines who gets paid what for what jobs and who can get employed and all this sort of thing. But once we once we've settled our issues about that, televisions are not special. You, you can afford them on the market or you're not. We use the market for rationing to our television supply. You know, we just use a free, a relatively free market for determining who gets which televisions out of our limited supply of televisions and the stuff we use to make televisions. On the other hand, a lot of people f would find a market objectionable for determining, um, say, who gets... Uh, education, right? It is relatively, not entirely, right? So, libertarians, I know you're out there, but you know, it's relatively uncontroversial in the United States and in a lot of countries, most countries probably, um, that everyone should have access to at least basic primary education. And if you cannot pay for it, then the government in some way is responsible for ensuring that you get it, right? Whether it's a voucher program or it's public provision of education or what, many people find it objectionable, the, the idea that, that if you couldn't afford education, if your family couldn't afford education, you just have to go without it, many people find that objectionable, right? They don't think it should be a pure market rationing of our the resources that go into education. So. When you think about what is a morally acceptable way to determine to what to determine who gets what health care, an important part of that decision is probably going to turn on do you think health care is special? If it's not special, a market based system is probably going to look pretty unobjectionable. If it is special, a market based system might look pretty objectionable. Okay. And one special problem with determining this is that health may involve comparing across groups or comparing difficult to commensurate values. Um, so, you know, utilitarians are going to say, no, everything goes down to, to happiness or whatever. But on an intuitive level, at least, health can look difficult this way. There are, you know, there's there's illness and then there's illness, and it can be hard to try to figure out well which is, you know, which is worse, right? So take something like, and this actually came up in um, uh, an infamous decision by the state government of Arizona about how they're going to do their health care. Um, bad teeth are a genuine health problem, right? Ultimately, it can kill you, but even if we don't get to that, right? Like, it's uncomfortable to have bad teeth. It causes other kinds of problems if your teeth are decaying, right? So having good dentistry is a genuine health need, or at least as genuine as anything else, right? Kidney transplants, if your kidneys have failed, are also, you know, a genuine health need, right? You will die, typically, or you'll at least need extremely onerous and, and intrusive dialysis. Um, if you if you are unable to get a working kidney, 
but it's kind of hard to compare some of these things. Right? It's at least not straightforward. The utilitarians are committed to thing you can do it, but it's at least not straightforward. Right? How many toothaches are equivalent to someone dying of kidney failure, for instance? How do you compare those sorts of things? You can compare them just on the cost, but you know, the cost is not necessarily going to tell you which is more important. Right? Um, the, uh, <clears throat> it can be pretty cheap to save someone from dying from dehydration that you get from having too much diarrhea from dysentery, right? But that doesn't mean it's less important, it just means it's cheaper. So now, there are various ways that people have tried to address this. Um, it, policy actors use things like both death rates, they also use now things um, very popular to use things called quality adjusted life years to try to work this out. But the point is that it's at least not morally straightforward to figure out how you compare health outcomes um, that are fairly different in character. All right, so three basic solutions to rationing of health care. Uh, and, and these actually kind of apply to almost anything, right? But three basic solutions to rationing of health care have been proposed. Um, and again, there's probably more other variations, but here's at least three major ones. First is to the market, right? Um, people just buy whatever they want and can afford. If you don't want it or can't afford it, then you don't get it. No system, no, no functional system for health has ever been, as far as I know, at least in the modern world, I don't know about ever, right? But in the, in the contemporary industrialized world, no system has ever been purely market driven. Um, again, if you remember during some of the debates, um, during the presidential campaign recently, one of these questions, one, one of the questions raised was, um, well, what, what should we do with uh, someone who doesn't have any health insurance and shows up at the emergency room with something life-threatening? And infamously, a number of people in the crowd, when this question was asked, I think it was asked of Ron Paul, they said, let him die, right? Um, very few people actually endorse that view. <laughs> and there, there, there's no modern and modern system of healthcare in in the in the industrialized world that has that view even the pretty market based uh, American system we're still pretty market based even post ACA but even before uh, the ACA we still had certain kinds of non market fail safes um, in particular the fact that there was that that it it was legally mandated that if you show up at an emergency room, you be you be treated. There are some exceptions and nuances to this, but the bottom, the basic bottom line is that you you needed to be treated by emergency room if you showed up. Um, and in fact, this is one of the things that led to some of the economic efficiencies in the system that people uh, were and are hoping that a more universal system will fix. Right? Somebody has to pay the doctor who sees you if you go to the emergency room. Uh, typically this is handled through states, how they handle the payment, but no matter what the details of the policy, ultimately the people who ended up paying for these things were uh, either other people with insurance or taxpayers. Right, it got paid for through one of those two ways, and typically it was massively less efficient, right, than uh, than if it happened some other way. If you are, if you don't have insurance, um, you two things happen, right? One is that you may wait until something is very serious before you go to the emergency room, in which case, well, you know, it's going to be more costly to fix it uh, when you get there, right? Um, some small problem that could have been fixed with an inexpensive medication or intervention may be much more expensive to fix by the time it's something that makes you go to the emergency room. There are also just costs associated with the emergency room. If you go to the emergency room for something that a nurse practitioner could fix in, uh, you know, in, a, in a clinic office, probably it ends up costing the system more uh, than if you were able to go do that. So, you know, this is one of the inefficiencies that people had hoped would be fixed. But, you know, you could say, all right, we're willing to accept that kind of inefficiency, especially for the moral advantages of the rest of the market working, even though we want to have maybe that fail safe. Or, you know, it is a consistent position to say we should not have fail safes like that. 
time that that you know if you can't afford it you can't afford it um, and especially if you don't think that it's special right you might say why should this be any different than uh, you know you can't afford something else that you really want okay and there are both moral and practical advantages people claim for this um, you know it's often claimed to be more efficient uh, and especially a lot of folks who favor market solutions will say that a lot of the inefficiencies that we know have existed in the pretty market-based American system are actually the result of, of it not being marketized enough rather than it being a market and you know if you have a kind of libertarian bent then there may very well be moral advantages to a market system, right? Uh, because again, like with anything else, uh, it comes back to the fundamental libertarian intuition that no matter how nice it is that you get something that you want or need, we have to also consider the fact that if the government or the society is providing it to you, it's doing it by taking resources away from somebody else. Okay. A second kind of uh, solution to this is a technocratic solution. Um, this would be to essentially put it in the hands of a government agency. Uh, most universal systems have some kind of version of this where uh, they will decide um, you know, what kinds of things get paid for, how much doctors get paid for uh, doing procedures, what kinds of procedures will be approved and will not. Um, and you know, we talked about a little bit before this issue of very expensive procedures of marginal value. They may decide whether or not the, the, the value is low enough to say, no, we're just not going to allow people to have this procedure, or at least the system is not going to pay for it. Um, they may make technocrats, the advantage of the technocrat is that it may make uh, efficient decisions by some measure of efficiency, uh, but at the same time, as we talked about a couple minutes ago, determining what is maximizing value or efficiency in terms of healthcare involves lots of judgments about how to balance certain kinds of values. So handing it over to uh, some kind of technocratic system may usurp those value conflicts, right? Their definition of what is efficient or uh, maximizing the utility may not be what a lot of the people in the society like. Or you could have a democratic or participatory system. Uh, in a state, this would probably involve some kind of, you know, this is the kind of thing that Daniels envisions, right? Some kind of citizen councils, uh, oversight, transparent process where people can comment on the rules, that sort of thing. A more deliberative, uh, participatory kind of thing, and, you know, in line with what some of the civic Republicans and deliberative Democrats think the whole system should look like, but possibly of special importance for healthcare, if you, th especially if you think like Daniels, that it has the special fundamental importance, um, and you're worried about the value conflicts that that go in. So this may drastically increase legitimacy, at least if you if you think deliberation increases legitimacy, um, but it probably is going to have some downsides. May very well be inefficient, right? Like everything else that smacks of deliberative democracy, we're probably talking about a lot of meetings. Um, you know, referenda are not the most efficient way of doing things. Public meetings are not the most efficient way of doing things. It may also lead to weirdly uneven outcomes. Um, you know, it may be a less coherent system than something like a technocratic approach. Um, and one concern is that in real states, you may practically end up with technocrats, right? Um, lots of agencies in the United States, for instance, and, L and other democracies allow for public comment periods on policy. But I'm going to bet that most of you have never <laughs> or maybe rarely said anything during a public comment uh, period. And as a, as a practical matter, the groups that have the most influence on things like public comment are then also, you know, even when they, when they, when the public comment period means something, the groups that have the most influence tend to be organized interest groups, 
who can sort of get together and have the year. So one concern is that participatory systems may ultimately devolve into a kind of technocracy, right? If you like technocracy, maybe this is evolve, right? But if you like the participatory idea, it may be hard to maintain it, Again, not just for healthcare, but for anything. Okay, so let's change tack a little bit um, and talk about some things besides the, the big fight about how do we distribute healthcare. One thing that's worth taking moral notice of is that how healthy you are turns out not to be just a function of what kind of medical care you have access to, but it also seems to reflect underlying social, economic status uh, disparities in the society. So it turns out um, individuals have different health outcomes across major political divides. Uh, economic divides, class divides, racial divides, gender divides, even when you control for access and even when you control for overall wealth. So two of the big results that have made people think about this is it turns out they did, so they did a study in Britain where it turned out that um, people who were of, who were poor, people who were lower socioeconomic status, tended to have worse health outcomes, even though everybody in Britain has access to the exact same system. Everybody has the National Health Service, it's not a two-tiered system. Everybody, in principle, should be able to get the same health care. People who are poor ended up being less healthy. In the United States, um, there have been some studies on uh, maternal child health, and it turns out that African American women statistically have worse maternal child health outcomes than women than than white women and this even this is what was interesting about this one is this is even if you control for economics right one very plausible explanation you might think of this would say well in the united states african americans are disproportionately poor um you know compared to their share of the population so maybe it's because you know African American women tend to be poorer than white women. But even if you control for economics, it turns out, you know, wealthy, well educated African American women still have worse outcomes than, um, than wealthy, well educated white women. And the bottom line of all of this, in a nutshell, it's, it seems that injustice may be bad for your health, period. Uh, so the argument is basically that by the time you get to a doctor, by the time you avail yourself of the healthcare system, your body has been subject to all sorts of shocks from your environment. And people who are members of disadvantaged groups in their society, their bodies are typically going to be subject to more shocks, right? So if you are a poor person living in Britain, um, yeah, maybe you can see just as good a doctor as anybody else but you're gonna be subject to all sorts of other kinds of things, right? Um, you're likely to have less education and so maybe understand how to make the best use of the healthcare available that uh, less than someone who is wealthier. You're likely to eat less healthy food, right? You're likely to live in an area where there is worse pollution, all these sorts of things. So even if the doctors are the same, all these other things are gonna to tend to make you less healthy. Um, in the United States, one of the, you know, it's difficult to establish this directly, but one of the theories about why we have this disparity in outcomes for African American women is just that, not to put too fine a point on it, living in a society where there's still a lot of uh, racial animus and racial discrimination causes more stress, even for African American women who are in a better socioeconomic position, it just causes stress that manifests itself through, through lower statistical outcomes. Um, so one big question is, that comes from this, I mean, it, if we care about health, we probably have to take some sort of moral notice of this. We can't morally address health just through the health care system. But there's a pressure in a fairly radical direction if we take this seriously. The bottom line is that if we take disparity seriously, it looks like this may push us into a position where we have to have a more radical redistribution of resources in society than we would otherwise need to worry about if we weren't worried about these health effects, right? So to take a Rawlsian kind of position, one concern is that um, 
the difference principle, the maximum principle that Rawls accepts, allows for, at least in principle, right, allows for fairly large inequalities in wealth. Um, you know, probably in the real world, not as large as some of the inequalities we actually have, but fairly large. But if it turns out that wealth inequality on its own leads to health, damage to health, it might mean that we need to be even more egalitarian than, than Rawls and some of the other liberal egalitarians are. There's debate about this. It's not an absolute yes, it's true, it's, but it's, it's something that we need to worry about. And then we have a question, right? Should we go along with this, right? Do we, does, it, does this mean we need to take a more radical view of distribution, or does this mean we've gone wrong somewhere in trying to treat health as special? The other kind of issue, aside from the resource distribution one that we might worry about, is social control of the body. Basically, if we make it the state's business to ensure that everyone is healthy, right? We're making the state's business to, to ensure that everyone has something like normal human functioning of their body. Um, we're basically making it the state's business to define what is normal human functioning. Uh, or at least that's how it looks. Right? It, it's, it's not clear that we can have the state involved with, or the community, if you like, but, you know, but basically the state in policy terms, involved with making sure that everyone has good health without, again, the state involved in deciding what is good health. Um, and there are some real, this is not just sort of an abstract, weird French philosopher kind of concern, there are some real questions about this. Um, the reason I gave you this latent an article is that this came up with the Affordable Care Act, right? Is being able to control her reproductive life, particularly through the through access to contraceptions and abortion, is that part of what normal human functioning is for a woman, right? Um, and you can see there's debate about this. Right, you, and you can see. I, I think whichever side you accept, you can at least see where the other side is getting its argument from. The folks who want to say no, this should, you know, um, even if we say that everybody, the state should provide for everyone to have good health, the body's reproductive organs are there to create children. So, yeah, maybe we have to say the state can't stop you from interfering with that, but it's not normal functioning to be able to not have children um, using your reproductive organs, right? Normal functioning is to have children. On the other side, people would say, well, no, 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 right? What it is to be a normally functioning adult human being is to have control over various kinds of bodily processes, especially ones like having children that are tied up with all sorts of other social things, right? Um, what it is to be in good health, reproductively speaking, for a woman, involves being able to have or not have children, depending on you know what what she wants. Um, so, if the state had nothing to do with how people got health care, this wouldn't really arise as a question. But since the state is involved, now we. You know, it seems like we now have to get involved in that argument about what is it for a human body to be normally functioning, to be in good health. There are other kinds of cases that come up with this, right? There's the uh, discussions of whether, um, you know, uh, there were there was a case probably I'm getting old, probably ten years ago now, um, about a deaf couple who were having a child through IVF and wanted to be able to ensure that the child was deaf. You get questions about should they? Is this harming the child? Right. I mean, most of us would consider going deaf to be a bad thing. We wouldn't welcome it. But at the same time, they said no. There's a deaf culture that we're part of. We want our child to be part of. So there's a big debate about that. Peter Singer has come under fire from lots of disability groups um, for basically saying that uh, disabilities inherently make your life worse and that there are lots of disabilities that um, make it such that your life is not worth living, right? Um, not endorsing this, I'm reporting to you what Peter Singer has said. You can understand why this makes 
people who are disabled quite worried and angry about him, right? Um, so there are lots of hard questions about what it is to be a normal human body that suddenly we're involved with as a community and as a state if the state gets involved in the provision of health care. Now, unless we go whole hog K to institute and get the state out entirely, turns out we're enmeshed in this, whether we like it or not. You know, the Affordable Care Act didn't start this, it just sharpened things in the United States. But any kind of state where you're doing things like regulating medical practice, licensing doctors, right, um, you've got these kinds of concerns, right? Even if we weren't worried about universal access, you might have questions about what healthy bodies look like coming up, right? So, for instance, uh, to take uh, an admittedly sort of uh, unusual example, right, it's not a large, there are people, um, actually, you know, let me take a better example. You might end up asking questions about things like, um, you know, transgendered people. Should we allow doctors to do this or treat it as a kind of malpractice, right? Most of the time, if I went into a doctor, and this this is the original thing I was think, thinking of, um, a doctor would probably at least face severe troubles if uh, she granted me a voluntary amputation, right? There's actually some debate about whether this is okay or not, right? But I just say, look, I, it's not that my arm is gangrenous, I just don't like it anymore, right? I want to get rid of it. And so we might raise questions about things like transgendered people, right? Even if we're not worried about the government, like, getting involved in paying for it or anything like that, is this a normal medical procedure that doctors should be allowed to do or, or not, right? If you have any kind of government regulations on doctors, you're involving yourself in these questions about the body. Um, okay. So, and this basically raises the corollary questions, right? You know, what purposes should a normal body serve, right? Foucault is very concerned in the reading they gave you that the state basically defines the normal body, and this is a horrible caricature of Foucault, but, but the bottom line is that the state basically creates institutions of medicine to literally create bodies that are useful to the state. Right? We, our society creates bodies that are useful for the kinds of things we want. Um, in the contemporary age, right, a good example of where there's a debate about this is things like, um, you know, things like Ritalin for kids, right? Uh, what's the problem with a kid running around and being very energetic? You know, in a hunter-gatherer society, maybe not that much. In our society where we want that child to go get an office job where she can sit and stare at a computer screen for eight hours a day, you know, it's a problem. Um, I read the blog of a psychiatrist who primarily serves poor urban populations, and his basic argument is that most of the people in that he sees don't have pathologies, right? They're depressed because they're poor and they live in crappy situations but the way that the state essentially keeps that in control is by hiring people like him to hand out antidepressants um, and, and sort of keep the population pacified. So, you know, these are ways to make it sound really creepy and scary, right? But there are questions about how do we determine, you know, what purposes the normal body is supposed to serve? And, you know, you get questions about whether or not this is even the kind of thing that states should be making decisions about, right? Even if we don't worry that the even if our worry is not primarily that the state is making a bad decision about what a normal body is, what purposes the normal body serves, we might think this is just not the kind of thing the state should be involved with at all. If you think people have a basically absolute right to control their body, maybe this is just not the sort of thing the state should be involved with at all. And this raises questions about policy, right? It's not e it's it's not easy. It's not as easy as just saying, well, the state should let people do what they want, because then we're back to these questions about what kinds of things, right? Do we really mean libertarian absolutism, right, where do what they want in the sense that like doctors in the emergency room can do what they want if someone dying shows up at the door, and if not, you know, well, then we're back to this question, right? What's an emergency? What's the state going to pay for? Is the state going to tell you that, um, you know, 
if you have a gallstone and you're in pain, we'll pay to get that out. But if you feel that you are a um, a man trapped in a woman's body, that you know that psychological pain is not something the government will get involved with. Right? It's hard to escape these questions, and it's also not clear that removing state control from this makes us freer, because we can then get back to the uh, everybody rations thing. If you remove state control from these things, it's not like la di da everyone gets what they want. You just make them subject to control by other kinds of things. If the state wasn't involved in deciding who gets what, well, then the market's involved in deciding who gets what. Uh, that might be an increase in freedom, but it's not obvious and tautological that is an increase in freedom. Okay, so let me summarize this. There's a lot of stuff we could talk about. Um, this is actually fascinatingly complex problems that arise, but bottom line, uh, major issues are this. Most people have an intuition that health is in some sense special. Um, that's, that being healthy is not just like owning the TV that you want. But the basis for its specialness and the moral implications of the specialness, and whether we ultimately want to, on reflection, say that yes, it is special, it's difficult to work out. Every system has to ration the resources for good health in some way. We don't have enough for everyone to get everything they could possibly want. And once we decide what kind of rationing we're doing, if the public typically through the government, is involved in that in any way, it's going to entangle us in really hard questions about the nature of the body um, and how far public decision-making should be able to reach into those extremely personal and private questions about bodily integrity. And there are no easy answers there.